Hi, hello everyone. Welcome to the Persist series and happy International Women's Day. I am Camila Esmajid and I am so excited to host for Discover E's conversation series for women in engineering and tech. I am an engineer. I am also a project management professional and I'm currently the director of operations here at Merck, a global pharmaceutical company. I am also an avid community service advocate I'm passionate about creating inclusive environments in STEM. And as your host, I'm so excited to talk with women about thriving in their careers. So this year, the Persist Series is proud to partner with none other than the Women in Engineering Proactive Network, also known as WePAN. Together, we are building a community and creating change to help women in STEM reach their fullest potential. So guess what? Today, I am so excited to celebrate women in STEM by introducing you to today's speaker, Monica Morales. Let me tell you a bit about Monica. Monica is a water engineer at Jacobs and lives in Reno, Nevada. She is currently working on several projects to protect water resources in Utah and Nevada and to help fight future droughts in Southern California. Her technical experience is in conveyance design, and she also works in project management and business development in the water market. Monica earned her Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in civil engineering from Oregon State University, and she is deeply passionate about sharing her career path to help diversify the future of STEAM, of the STEAM workforce. So today, Monica will share her experience as a first-generation college graduate and how she has prevailed over adversity in her early career as a young woman in a male-dominated field. So let's sit back and relax, let's watch her video, and then be sure to tune in for our live Q&A. See you then. So I'm Monica Morales, I'm a water engineer and I work at Jacobs. I'm physically based in our Reno, Nevada office and then work with colleagues out of Los Angeles, London, Northern California, um, etc. I received my degrees as a first generation college student from Oregon State University, a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering and a Master of Science in Civil Engineering. And how I found out about civil engineering as a high school student was a civil engineer sat down to gamble at my mother's blackjack table where she was a blackjack dealer. And she engaged him in a, a great conversation, asked him loads of questions about his line of work because she knew she had a little girl at home who was super interested in math and science but didn't really know what to do with that. So she came home really excited um, and said, Monica, you should Google engineering. I think you'd really like it. And maybe you should pursue that as your major for school instead of art, because I also really loved painting and being creative and had all these different ideas of if I wanted to go into fashion design, become a doctor. Um, I wanted to be able to help people, but I was also really, really good at math and science at school. So I looked up all the different kinds of engineering and I related to civil engineering the most in that I saw it every day. I had a tangible idea of what I could be doing and I could help lots of people with it. So it worked out um, despite being in the economic crisis of 2008, graduating high school, coming from a low income family where my both my parents worked in casinos with at minimum wage jobs and going out of state for school. So born and raised in Reno, Nevada and pursued uh, you know, my college degrees in Oregon. Um, we, we made it work. I minimized my student loans and was able to get fully funded for my master's degree from Oregon State. So it was just kind of a dream come true. My mom put it as, um, Monica, you get to go to your Hogwarts and uh, we made it happen. I was the first of my family to graduate, um, become an engineer and get a graduate degree as well. Now I get to wake up every morning and successfully get to say that I'm helping solve future droughts in Southern California through my work as a water resources engineer. 
I've definitely seen my fair share of sexism um, through my pathway in engineering, especially as a young woman, Latina, um, first generation American um, from my father's side, very um, intersectional items that I've personally faced in, in the workforce, where I've had questions from people um, at agencies where I've worked um, where they'd ask me where I was from and then I'd say oh I'm from Reno Nevada because I've worked in other states outside of Nevada and then they'd ask me again no where are you really from and then having to take a step back of oh you're asking for my ethnicity you're not necessarily asking where I've lived and um, having to explain oh okay well my father's from Leon Guanajuato Mexico or Mexico and uh and then he met my mother in Reno, Nevada. My mother was adopted. Um, we haven't yet found out her biological father, but her biological mother is Caucasian. Um, and, and then they'd say like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to uh, um, get into the personal details. And it's like, well, actually you did because you asked me, you know, my ethnicity. And now that um, my mother has been able to find her biological father's side, I can definitively say I'm three quarters Mexican and one quarter uh, white. And um, the, 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 I understand that being um, from a mixed race um, makes it people have more questions of like, oh, you don't look Mexican. It's like, well, what does Mexican look like? Um, I, I, I do look Mexican. I look like my father and he's from Mexico um, and, and there's facets to that. And then in terms of sexism, you know, being perceived as a young, attractive woman, you tend to get more um, men who normally work with only men uh, treat you or uh, give a sense that they want to build a romantic relationship rather than a working relationship with you. and. You know, growing up as a tomboy and um, playing with boys during recess at school or um, having a larger male friendship, I've been able to learn how to navigate. No, I don't want to pursue a romantic relationship. I do want to pursue a working relationship with you and being able to create, you know, like the friendship or work colleague standard um, and, and not being flirtatious and not reacting to it that way. Um, I, I would say that that's probably been one of the most uncomfortable positions I've been in, um, being a young woman in engineering is having to navigate that while being respectful and unfortunately having to be polite um, despite others not treating you with the same respect or being as polite because they're trying to seek a romantic relationship or um, testing the waters in that sense. So having to be the bigger person and navigate that is extremely difficult, especially when you're starting out in your career. And the choices that you make when you're a young woman and understanding how you could be perceived is also something really challenging when you're starting your career and understanding, you know, you're creating this basis and this baseline of how people are going to perceive you and the re reputation you build for yourself. So it, it's very tricky. Fortunately, I haven't run against to too many situations that they've escalated. Um, and it, fortunately for me, it's been okay. Uh, you know, I'm sensing uh, not a great relationship here with this person who's not treating me very well. I can avoid them as much as possible and um, focus on this group of people who do respect me and work well with me. I've also had close male colleagues um, who were great male allies. So it, it's really helpful when uh, somebody else is able to kind of see the situation and help speak up for you. 
uh, there, there are many instances where that could be the case where, you know, even if you aren't in leadership or management, but you are somebody with privilege, um, another white male um, in industry along with other men, you hear something sexist, racist, etc. that's unfair, and you help speak up for the person who identifies as any of those that aren't the majority in this male-dominated field, it's extremely helpful because, for one, I don't don't have to expend the emotional energy in order to say this is wrong this hurts my feelings this this is this shouldn't um, be stated uh, I should feel safe you know in this working environment if somebody else is able to step in and say all those things it it's just so helpful where I don't have to expend that and then also where somebody uh, is able to establish like hey this is not okay then it it creates you know, a more general fairness or uh, uh, safe space for that working group. It sets the stage of, nah, don't do that around me. It's extremely helpful and extremely powerful. So anybody at any, any level, um, it helps when it's from management and leadership, but it can help from, you know, peer-to-peer -peer level. Anybody can speak up. Um, and then I've also kind of uh, made a promise to myself during the shutdowns during the pandemic of if I see something I'm going to speak up especially if it's for somebody else because I've been in too many situations where I wish I could have spoken up for myself or um, spoken up despite being labeled a, a stereotype as that oh the angry Latina she's getting fired up and spicy um uh uh, and not wanting to be labeled that and just staying quiet so instead I made a promise to myself of if I see something or if I can stick up for somebody, I I'm going to do that. So for people who have wanted to ever leave the profession or engineering, I've had to talk to a few people um, thinking maybe engineering wasn't for them and then help them realize okay, is it just your office environment? Because office by office is usually very different within any company or agency. Is it the work you're doing? Is it your workload? Um, oftentimes, sometimes um, entry-level engineers can get overloaded with work and then they feel like they have no time to themselves and they don't know how to say no. Or sometimes they don't like this specialty within engineering or civil engineering, especially since it's so broad and they don't realize that they could quickly um, move to this different um, kind of field with the same skill set and items and experience that they've gained. Um, so even if maybe you're not in the perfect situation, you can always change companies. You can always um, change environments, move to a different location, uh, you know, create the space that best fits you. Um, I know my first career out of um, uh, my, my college degrees out of grad school um, it was ideally fantastic in terms of workload, but not ideal in location. And then I've had situations where I was in a better location, but the mentorship wasn't there. And then had situations in the same company where, you know, um, this project was fantastic, but uh, this project team was even better to work with. So you're able to navigate and create your, you know, best fit situation. And it doesn't mean that leaving engineering um, is the solution. Sometimes you just have to create those little tweaks for yourself in order to create, you know, that ideal work environment. By creating those little small shifts and changing companies, offices, etc., can make the world of difference for you and your work culture and environment, especially when it comes to your workload and being able to say no to things and people respecting, you know, you saying no to things too. Thank you for sharing your so unique story. We're so happy to have you. Yeah, happy to be on the call and happy International Women's Day. All right, let me show you your flower for today. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, but you may be noticing we have someone else on the screen. I would like to introduce everyone to our second panel guest, Gladys Pudasinha. 
Clarice is a civil engineering associate in the Water Systems Project Management Office at Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And she helps manage hundreds of millions of dollars in capital improvement projects for the water system. She graduated from CSUN with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering and a Master of Science in Structural Engineering. Clarice is a major foodie and loves traveling, spending time with her baby and fur baby and going to Disneyland. So welcome, Monica and Clarice. I feel like we have the dream team on. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And for everyone who are tuning in live, get ready to submit your questions using the Q&A functions. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see Q&A and I see it's starting to light up. So that's great. So make sure you take a look at the bottom of the toolbar and you'll see it. So I actually want to get started with a few questions for our panelists. So as I said, happy International Women's Day. We were given these flowers as I walked into my office today. I felt very honored and special. So can you all start by sharing with our audience you know, our audience of women or a woman, which which person has been the biggest impact on you? When you think of the women, many women in your lives, or maybe one woman in particular, who has made the biggest impact and why and how? I, I definitely touched on this in the video of, you know, my mother being a big advocate and coming back home and telling me all of the information that she learned at work with from this one conversation. Uh, and she continued to do that from when I was four to um, now. Uh, she helped give me that confidence of that can-do attitude, especially since she didn't have a mother growing up. She didn't have really a family to uh, support her. So with when she had me, she put everything into me and I can't be more grateful for that. Um, it just made it so I was an even more confident woman and I'm really excited for that opportunity when I get to be a mother and continue to pass that on of uh, that self-confidence and trying to make a positive impact in the world through yourself and your family and what you can do now on this earth. Wow, she sounds like a remarkable person. Clarice and you, who has been the women or that one woman that has made an impact on you? So I would have to say it would also be my mother. Um, growing up, she was always positive, no matter what challenges she would face. And she always had a smile on her face. And of course, everyone would say that I have her smile. And now everyone is saying that my daughter um, also has the same smile. So I feel like her outlook on life has rubbed off on me. And I like to always see um, the best in a situation. And I hope that my daughter will grow up with the same kind of outlook in life. Wow, that's wonderful. Mothers are very important and it's great to hear how they've impacted both of your lives and what a wonderful smile you certainly have. So we have lots of different women that are tuned in and probably women and many people of color listening right now who may be either in college or the early part of their career or maybe even a late stage of their career. And you know, they may be struggling or actually considering leaving the field. And Monica, you kind of touched on this a bit. What advice do you have for them? And can you identify with some of those struggles that you may have hit at some point in your career that made you pause and say, should I, shouldn't I? I always like to say, especially to young women um, who are unsure if they want to major in engineering or anything in STEAM, is that by being you and entering the field, you make a positive difference just by being there. So that always is helpful to me whenever I am feeling a little down and I reach in my back pocket of I'm making a positive difference. I matter here. My perspective is very valued um, in that I'm of 2% of Latinas in civil engineering employed in the United States. So I am going to persist and, and pursue this dream career of mine and continue to make a welcoming env environment for everybody else who's coming in. And I'm so exciting to see even more women um, come into the field. And then sometimes the majority of my calls are women um, who are all working together to try to solve these really challenging problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Clarice? 
So I would say during college, it's definitely tough. I remember all the long nights of studying, doing your homework, preparing for the exams. Like there are times where it's very overwhelming, but once you get through it and you graduate, there are a lot of job options compared to other industries that will make it definitely worth all that hard work. And for any professionals that are struggling right now with their current uh, job, I, as Monica had mentioned in her um, interview, I think considering moving groups, just because to me, in the workplace, the people that you're surrounded by make a huge difference. So moving groups or moving companies might be the best option. I know um, after I had graduated, I worked for the city of Calabasas um, part-time and I did need to uh, get a full-time job at that point. So I had worked um, at a private company um, and at that private company, um, it was a very bad experience where everything was unorganized and it was a very specific field where um, everyone had to teach me um, the work that was being done, but everyone was so busy that they didn't have time to uh, teach me. And um, it was a very toxic environment where people would be yelling at each other. And there were even people that would be crying at their work desk just because of how overwhelmed they were with everything. And after experiencing all that, um, I did question um, if I was in the right field, thinking that this could be how it is for a lot of companies. But I told myself maybe it's just like what I'm currently surrounded by. And um, I started applying for a bunch of jobs. And thankfully, um, there was one company where I was able to be hired on the spot and I left. And um, with that, I did have an eye-opening experience where it's not just that um, one experience where I had, but it's a lot better with a, a bunch of other companies. So um, thankfully, now I'm, I'm at LADWP and I couldn't be happier with um, where I'm at. That's fantastic. You know, sometimes yeah. you have to take a path that's probably not the prettiest, but it's the lessons that you learn from it. And to hear that you're happy at LADWP is fantastic. And speaking of LADWP and for you, Monica, at Jacobs, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you do? We've got Rebecca that chimed in on the Q&A and she's like, I want to know more about what they do. What do you lead? Do you lead teams? What are some of the projects that are impactful? And where, where do you see those projects going? Are you around senior leaders? Like, tell us about that a bit more. Yeah, so... so Oh. <laughs> That's so, how happy you all are about your <laughs> careers. You're all jumping in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at LADWP, I currently work in the project management office um, where I specifically lead the um, capital improvement projects for the water system. And I mainly work on trunk line projects, which are pipelines that are greater than uh, 20 inches in diameter. So um, with those projects, I make sure that they go through planning, design, and construction. And for me, it's just um, crazy how large of a worth the projects are. I remember when I graduated from college, I was like, oh, wow, I get to work on a $2 million project. But now that I'm at LADWP, a lot of the projects are over like $100 million. So um, being able to work with such large infrastructure projects that help impact um, the Los Angeles area makes it very worth it. And I think something that's very unique to, for my position um, working for a public agency is that I do deal with the public a lot. So aside from managing the projects, I do a lot of presentations for local neighborhood councils, uh, council districts, and informing residents about um, the impacts uh, for the projects in the area. So um, that's a little bit about what I do. Awesome. awesome. And, and to give a shout out to Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, they have an all women board right now, which is just absolutely amazing, especially since um, engineering is very male dominated and uh, boards affiliated with agencies can be too. So I, I feel like that's really inspiring in itself. Uh, especially for other young women or women uh, considering pursuing engineering. Um, and, and so if I have to speak technically on what I do, because there's a lot of non-technical um, management, people, uh, relationships uh, kind of work that I do, but technically it's designing pipelines to get 
generally from a water treatment plant to people's homes. And so in terms of work in Los Angeles, one of the coolest projects that we did was a pipeline routing study. So similar to what Clarice just explained with trunk lines, uh, how do we uh, effectively route and construct a 96 inch diameter pipeline through the heart of Los Angeles, where there's lots of existing utilities, lots of existing underground pipelines in existing roads. Um, how do we fit something you could drive within um, uh, through an existing road uh, for the minimum cost, uh, especially since people's taxpayers help um, pay for projects like these, um, and uh, minimize impacts to neighborhoods. Uh, does this make sense uh, in this busy street versus this busy street? Uh, and, and thinking about the different items that go into that of, okay, how many residencies will this impact? How many businesses will this impact once it's constructed? And, and so that pipeline was uh, spanned 20 miles um, in length. So we physically drove and did a windshield study of all those roadways to get, you know, the in-person information as well as a desktop study from Google Earth and seeing um, where are the overhead power lines, where are the existing utilities, and collecting all of that information from, I believe it was over 20 cities and agencies and working together and, and doing all that work. So that was kind of a, a glimpse into the, the technical work of, of what I've done. Wow. I, I think it's amazing, both of you, you know, the technical side of what you do, as well as the human touch, right? You know, no one knows all of the work that goes behind it has brilliant engineers like both of you and your team members that really drive a lot of our natural resources to get to homes and communities where it's needed most. So thanks so much for sharing that. So we had a question that came in for both of you and it says, how soon would you encourage young girls to become engaged in engineering? And Monica, you mentioned it's only 2% of Latinas that are represented in civil engineering. Um, there's also another part that also with computer science and coding, do you see enough attention focused on girls and coding other than the coding groups that we currently see? So I'd love for both of you to weigh in. Clarice, you want to start with all the K through 12 outreach that you do through American Society? For <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I can uh, just chime in. So I actually got involved with the American Society of Civil Engineers um, as a student volunteering for the Younger Member Forum because of the K through 12 outreach. Um, I think exposing um, students as young as elementary school is a great um, time to start just because they it's instilled and they're exposed to um, all these really fun engineering concepts and I personally love doing K-12 through outreach just seeing the joy that students um, get from building these bridges that are made out of um, gum drops and all that stuff it's it's a lot of fun so definitely starting early on and continuing to do these activities as they grow is a is good yeah yeah, I always think of it as when does somebody hear the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? That's usually when you're really young. And oftentimes people think of doctor, lawyer, architect, but not necessarily engineer. So I make it a personal mission of mine to go into elementary schools, um, especially kindergarten level, if I can, uh, to and to teach what engineering is, that we aren't geniuses, we just like hard problems and, and, and solving puzzles. Um, and that uh, someone like me who looks like me is an engineer. That way they can see, oh, this person grew up in the same neighborhood or kind of neighborhood that um, I did. They have um, a Mexican father like I do. Uh, they also uh, was brought up with Spanish at home like me. Uh, their, their parents aren't scientists or engineers, so maybe I can do it too. So sharing your personal story with children that are young helps beat the stigmas of, oh, I can't do that because of this, this, and this reason. It's more of, I can do that because of this, this, and this reason. That's fantastic. Shared experiences and storytelling really makes a difference. Because I'll tell you, I know in all of our industries, we need more and more engineers to help innovate so many different things in this world. So I actually have a comment in question that came in from Megan Bartley. She says that she's watching with her group of students. So hello to you all. And she says, in some of those students, some are guys. 
So what would you tell young men who are entering the engineering industry that would be helpful to broaden their scope of diversity in the future? Clarice, would you like to start? Yeah, so I would say that being an ally to the women in engineering is um, the best thing that you could do if you see that a woman is being um, overstepped and she's trying to put it and provide an input, I would say being that one person that'll say something for um, that woman would be one of the best ways that um, you could help broaden the diversity. And a lot of the companies do have these certain events that help um, promote diversity in women. And I think just ha helping promote those events and attending those events just shows that you're here to support um, the other women in the industry. Completely agree. Gender equality is not a women's issue. It's everybody involved and everybody benefits from it. Um, in terms of toxic masculinity, we can uh, eliminate that by promoting gender equality. So you as men, just like Clarice said, you can be allies and help understand right now there's an inequity and you can play a part to help provide that uh, equity in the future. So I, I remember when I was visiting, visiting a middle school and uh, we were talking about the different days we had for Engineers Week, which was a big outreach event that Los Angeles Younger Member Forum does. And I was the chair at the time. And I said how there's an elementary school day, a middle school day, high school day, a girl day, and a Girl Scouts day. And one of the little boys stood up and he said, that's not fair. How come there isn't a boys day? And then having to respond, of, well, currently there's only 20 to 25 percent of women in science and engineering right now. So imagine this auditorium and only a quarter of your class is girls instead of a, a half or a little more than half. That would be a little weird, right? When I went to school, when I was in a class of over 100 um, at a time, there was only 10 girls in that class. Imagine that. So this is why we have a Girl Scouts Day, and this is why we have a Girl Day for Engineers Week to help promote engineering to girls specifically, to make it so this room right now, which is 50-50, is the same in the engineering profession. So hopefully that helps you with not making it feel so unfair and understand that it's unfair right now. No, that's great. And, and I do want to applaud the work that both of you do in the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE, because there's so much that you do if, as far as outreach. There's so much that you do in terms of not just career advancement, but building leadership, building skills, and building that next generation. So kudos to the work that you're doing and that you're going to continue doing. And I love to hear the involvement with the Girl Scouts as a long time ago Girl Scout. Um, <laughs> all right, so we have a comment and question that came in, and I'd love for you both to touch on it. Do either of you deal with being overlooked or looked over or talked over or treated differently because you are women? And if so, how do you deal with that? Maybe you can give some recommendations to our audience members, maybe one or two. I've definitely been talked over. Um, sometimes it's a little bit of a stubborn move on my part where I won't let somebody interrupt me if they've already interrupted me once or twice and continue to finish my sentence. So th if they choose to interject while I'm still finishing my sentence, I will finish my sentence and then pause and, and then say, oh, I think you were trying to say something while I was finishing my sentence. And then, you know, create that as a, a you know, sense of let me speak and finish and then you speak and finish and then it's a more cordial conversation. So it's a quick um, tip that I've done and I think has been effective for me. I agree with Monica's tip. I feel like that has been the best way to approach a situation like that. And then I also think just having um, a supervisor or manager that um, is aware that that is happening and um, is able to call it out for you. Um, thankfully, I've been able to be in situations where my supervisor has been able to step in and say something. 
And I think the same goes to being overlooked with Clarice, what um, you said of having somebody help vouch for you and sponsor you, especially when you're not in the room, is really helpful. So again, finding those allies and then speaking up for yourself. Um, and then maybe at work, you don't have many leadership opportunities and you can gain those skills outside of work through nonprofit organizations where you can have uh, leadership opportunities and build those skills. And, and then sometimes you get a reputation or a name through that, which then transfers into your work and, of, oh, Monica can definitely handle this and she can present to uh, hundreds of people at a time. Let's have her do this, especially since she's really excited about it. Awesome. We have a nice comment that came that says, as an engineering professor, Sandra Afare, she said that she advocates for the young ladies in her classes and encourages them to speak up for themselves. So Monica, your suggestions are spot on, according to our professor. Um, yeah, so I, I want to take you guys back to, um, there was a question that came in from Jessica. And she says, are there some associations and intern programs where college students can utilize while they pursue a career in STEM? So while they're going through their studies, I wanted to kind of go back to that to kind of understand what are some of those experiences that you can get as you're building in before you get to a Jacobs or before you get to LADWP. I got to get that acronym correct, Clarice. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. So I can let a chime in. So as a student at Cal State Northridge, I was very heavily involved with the American Society of Civil Engineers, which is why I am still involved today. So I mainly joined just because there were student competitions, uh, mainly the Steel Bridge that I had first got involved with just because it brought me that uh, technical um, experience before I started working, which was great. And then um, aside from that, there were a lot of different projects that you can get involved with that did expose you to different fields of engineering and also brought that aspect of teamwork. And um, aside from all these technical projects, there is opportunities for you to take on leadership positions within these student chapters at each uh, university, which I think is a great way of building your leadership experience before you uh, graduate. So um, as a student, I worked my way up the ranks and eventually became president at CSUN. And I would say the best thing that I got out of that was my public speaking skills, just because if you saw Clarice in high school, I would not be the one to say anything to anyone since I hated um, speaking. But here I am today um, participating in this panel and doing project On management. On a live panel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so because of ASE, I like to think that um, I still do have that fear of public speaking, but it's been a lot more minimal and I've been able to get that practice. And aside from that, getting involved with groups such as ASCE does um, provide you a lot of opportunities to see about any internship um, opportunities or um, a lot of them also have companies that come and speak to the student chapter so you get exposed to all the different um, companies that are in the area so highly suggest ASE not that I'm biased but there's a lot of other great organizations such as Society of Women Engineers, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, um, NSBE, the list goes on and on there's so many different organizations that you could definitely take advantage of. Completely agree there's so many student <laughs> groups within engineering and uh, a really great way to build your teamwork, how you work well with others, because in no engineering project it, do you do something completely alone. It's always with others. So the more extracurricular experience that you get outside of your coursework, is it's just going to benefit you all around, especially with uh, what what kind of work is it that I want to do? And if you're able to do internships while in school, that'll help you explore even more of private versus public sector, uh, this area within engineering versus this area. How is a small office work versus a really big office? And it helps you when you get to that sticky point of, hmm, maybe this isn't the right fit. What do I do? Do I drop engineering completely? No. You just create those little <laughs> shifts for yourself to um, get in a better situation. I love the emphatic no. Whatever you do, don't <laughs> quit. Not only does it pay off, but you get to meet great people like yourself and you get to really impact the world. So that's great. The emphatic thing is don't quit, stay in. <laughs> So let's talk, let's kind of reflect back on um, imposter syndrome. I'm sure you all have 
um, experienced that or seen that. And there was a really good question that came in from one of our audience member, members, Capriana. And the question is, what advice or resources would you recommend for women engineers struggling with feeling inferior to their male counterparts? Big thing for me is everybody has learned this from the beginning at one point. Maybe other people have a little bit more of an advantage because they had a dad who was an engineer and was able to be exposed to it from a younger age, et cetera. So just think about everybody had a starting point and everybody's starting point is a little bit different, but your learning experience is completely valid. And oftentimes the more questions that you ask can be helpful for the group. Um, and your perspective of seeing something from a brand new lens can be really powerful because you're, you might be seeing something that others are overlooking. So I would, I always go back to that of if I'm having a hard time, it's, hey, I'm learning about this. Let me ask more questions and I'll get a little bit more help and then work through this together. Um, so it's really helpful to build those solid relationships that you can go to and say, hey, I'm having a hard time with this. Can you help me understand? And then you'll get on the right track and then everybody will continue to move forward. So I know when I am struggling with a situation, as Monica had mentioned, definitely asking questions. And I'm also the type of person that whenever I don't know something, I will try to Google whatever I can, look up anything I could find. And um, I think just taking advantage of all those resources and just reminding yourself that um, in these situations, like all of us are here to learn. And um, in the end, uh, just the amount of work that you put in, um, it'll be worth it. And in the end, and I try to remember that your goal in the end to just, just work your way up the management ladder. And if it takes asking questions to whomever and doing whatever, then that's what it'll take to um, move on up in the company. Awesome. No, I think that's great advice. You know, um, it, it's, it's great to hear from you all. Um, I think relying on allies, getting advice, not just settling for it, and utilizing ASC, SHIP, NSB, all those groups for the different trainings and the different experiences that they have. So I want to talk about work-life balance. So in your intros, Monica, you also mentioned that you would like to have a family in the future. Clarice, you do have a family that you just started, fur baby and actual baby. So <laughs> I have to mention the fur baby. Yes. I want you all to share, what, what are your experiences with work-life integration? Any lessons learned? You know, what are some of the things that have been shared with you with other colleagues, both male and female, in terms of how to balance that as you grow your career? Clarice, I'll let you start. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, she's got you're two so for a baby and a new baby. <laughs> in terms of being a president of a nonprofit, being a mother, and being an engineer, in I would say a a really esteemed and then also in high demand uh, work or agency. Yeah, so um, definitely entering motherhood <laughs> was quite the experience. Um, and has been challenging. But so I guess for my situation right now, I am currently only going into the office twice a week. Um, so thankfully, I've had that sort of balance where I have days where I am able to fully focus on work. But back in my mind, I do have that little guilt that I'm like, oh, I don't really get to spend time with my daughter. But I do try to remind myself that back then pre-COVID, I feel like it was just the norm to be in the office um, all day, um, every day. So um, um, I just remind myself that I, I am thankful to have this opportunity to spend time with my my daughter when I'm not in the office. But um, a big part of balancing motherhood work and also ASE, in my case, I would say is becoming an expert in time management. So um, I made sure that my baby is on a sleeping schedule. So five months before she was even born, I was taking as many classes and reading as many books as I could, just seeing what were the best ways that um, worked for different moms. And thankfully, um, there were a couple of options that um, worked well. And after three months, I was able to get my baby to sleep overnight for 10 to 12 hours straight. So uh, with that and like having her proper 
three to four hour naps during the day, I've been able to pretty much do focus on like work and like ASE during those um, times where I'm not really distracted and can focus on that. But um, when she isn't napping, I do try to uh, remind myself that I do want to um, spend time with my daughter just because she's at this age where she's super cute and a lot of fun and um, learning about everything in the world. So I do remind myself that um, I, I have to balance work and my daughter and also spending time with uh, my husband and taking care of myself. So I personally like to get my nails done once a month, just got to have that time for self-care. And <laughs> um, my mom does come over on Sunday night. So we try to take advantage and have date nights. So to me, making sure that you set aside time for yourself, for your husband, for your daughter, and also um, work is um, very important. And um, I'm very big on to-do lists. So for work stuff, I have a to-do list on my computer, but for my personal um, to-do stuff or to-do list, and also for ASD, I have it on my phone. If I think of something, I type it up in my notes. So um, for me, just managing time and having that list that I could always refer to when um, I have time to work on stuff is how I've been getting through all this craziness. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you're doing it well. Thank you. Monica, Monica, what about you looking to the future? And we also had a similar question came in from Emily Kofit, and she says she's just starting her career as a water resource engineer. So there's a lot of them online, Monica. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting more than I've known. And she's also thinking about motherhood, right? How will she plan forward? Like how how should she plan that navigation? Because she says, look, she wants to be able to continue working and, and, you know, adding contributions in her field, but still have that privilege and opportunity to pursue motherhood. So can you share? Yeah, I, I completely resonate with that um, uh, sentiment because it's exactly how I feel right now of, I want to pursue motherhood. I want to become a mother. And I also want to continue to be a, a good engineer and do something I'm passionate about. And it's not something where I have to do one or the other. Uh, maybe there's, uh, you know, some little tweaks again to make the situation a little bit more ideal in terms of the possibility of going to uh, be, um, I forget the term within Nat Jacobs. Uh, it's not part time, but it's uh, it's it's a little bit different from full time, where I can work from uh, thirty to forty hours as needed. Um, so we have different abilities of how many hours we can work within a week, and uh, to to create for that uh, more ideal situation. And uh, also at Jacobs, there's this new benefit for, for fertility um, and advice for that, and then um, adoption and in other areas of helping you form your family. So I think that's just so inspiring and encouraging that they want us to have, you know, our personal family life and are uh, providing resources to help build that, knowing that with happier employees, they're going to get better work from the employees and then they'll be able to do better work with that um, life uh, work balance. And I've heard one of the founders of one of the companies that was acquired by Jacobs that I was working with at uh, CH2M, um, Mr. Jim Howland, who would uh, say to to the new employees of, it's really important that you have a life outside of work. That way yeah. you are rejuvenated. And when you come back into work, uh, you can do your best work. So uh, just know that even um, founders uh, would give that advice to uh, early career professionals of definitely maintain that work-life balance. That way you can feel fulfilled in both aspects. And in terms of motherhood, I I'm just really excited for that opportunity and it's just getting there. That's awesome. Well, we wish you all the best of luck and we know that you'll get there and do very well. I think it's really good that both of you noted that you work for employees that really support that, right? That it's not a, it's not a deficit. It's not a hurdle. It's, that's a part of who Monica is and who Clarice is, and they just make it work. I think that's the wonderful thing that I see your companies and many others that are providing that support. So wonderful. Well, I'd like to go to a question that came in from Danielle Garlington, and she said, will you both speak to why it is so important for the civil engineering field to continue to seek a more diverse workforce. 
Can I go first, Clarice? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You all are so polite. I love it. <laughs> um, so one of my favorite statements on this is the public is incredibly diverse. And for us to create for better solutions, we need to mirror the public by being diverse ourselves. If we have a monolith of a group creating for solutions for a diverse population, there's going to be a, a missed items. It, it's just, you know, fact. So the more diverse that we can be to represent the diverse public that we're providing solutions for, the better solutions that we will be able to provide. So um, that's my personal thought of why it's so important for us to diversify, especially as civil engineers who basically create the foundation for society with providing safe shelter, a means of travel, and clean water. So I completely agree with Monica had mentioned. I know, so for me personally, obviously ASCE um, is one of the main organizations that I'm involved with, but I am also involved with a lot of organizations such as SWE, um, Asian American Architects and Engineers, and I get involved in all of these other organizations just because they're all very different. Um, and to me, just getting involved with another organization um, is eye-opening and seeing how things are, are ran, um, the different types of people, which um, is stuff that you could bring back to the table at work. So just getting exposed to um, diverse groups, I think, um, is really um, useful in the workplace, which is why it's also um, important to have a diverse um, group at work. And it's so more fun. Yeah, <laughs> it is more fun. You have so many people from different walks of life. So if you both could give one piece of advice, let's just say to the top five civil engineering firms, matter of fact, every engineering firm to say, how can they make their workplace more diverse? And also, how can they make it more welcoming so that more women and more people of color not just come into the field, but they stay? So what would be like your piece of advice? You'll say, these are the top two things that are really important. What I've really appreciated that Jacobs has done is created for a concerted effort of hiring more women into leadership positions. And the um, effect of that is one of our upcoming CFOs, uh, Claudia Hamarillo, she is Latina. She, she was born and raised in Colombia. And now um, myself, like looking up to our executive team, I literally get to see someone who looks like me on our leadership team. And that's a profound effect of, I am valued here. Uh, I can see someone who looks like me at the very top and it it's inspiring me to continue to want to grow in leadership at my company or anywhere that I'm at and having that sense of I can too. So if your companies also create for that concerted effort of, you know, hiring the best candidates and um, placing a particular emphasis on those that are less um, represented, represented in our field, then it it will have that amazing effect on everyone else. And then again, bring that diverse perspective into you know, your company too. So to add on what um, Monica said, it, it really does always start at management. Um, when I see that management is diverse and has someone like me, it, it does give me encouragement and hope that I could be like that person one day. Um, Monica had mentioned our board of commissioners at LADWP, which is the one that oversees um, the entire company of about 10,000 employees, is all women. And um, in the past four years that I've been here, two out of three of my directors are females. So just having that um, type of leadership to look up to um, gives me a lot of hope. And when companies have events that recognize women, um, it helps me feel like my voice is being heard. With this month being Women's History Month and today being International Women's Day, um, I'm really happy to see that my company is putting together these events to recognize um, women in the company. And also as a mom, um, I think it's great that um, for my company, they've actually have dedicated lactation rooms um, so that when 
um, a mother needs to pump and um, set aside that time during the day, we have those rooms or suites where we're able to uh, set aside time for that. So um, for me personally, just having um, a company that focuses on supporting the female employees um, has been great. Awesome. I think it's great. Again, it's just it's just wonderful to see so many companies that are creating that support. Lactation rooms are, are part of you being a mom and being able to do your job to the best of your ability and so many other things that come after that. I want to get to a question that Michelle Miranda, hopefully I said that correctly, put. So it goes as follows. Do any of you think that knowledge about engineering and practices with health from women in general she says that she finds herself struggling with not knowing how certain apparatuses work, but it seems to come off as common knowledge or intuitive for men in her career field. So what are your thoughts on that? And, and maybe can you offer her some advice on how to navigate? I guess from personal experience, when I relate my husband, who's a mechanical engineer and what he's grown up with versus me, he grew up with putting together cars and understanding how things um, connected versus me. I had no idea how to work power tools until college when I was in concrete canoe within American Society of Civil Engineers and just loving um, being able to do it and getting that experience. So again, the starting points of of when people learn certain things and how things work, physics, uh, there can be a gap there, but you can still fill that gap um, with that excitement and willingness to learn. Um, so yes, there may be a difference in, in how people grew up and what they were exposed to. I think that's mm -hmm. probably the big reason to your question, but we can all, um, you know, fill that gap and then learn as we go. And uh so th that's, again, my personal experience. And then I continue to try to get as much hands-on opportunities because it's really helpful for design. Yeah, so similar to Monica, I also was not really exposed to all that stuff until college because of ASE, which is why you should definitely get involved um, with these type of stuff in college. But um, I know when I first started, uh, a big thing for me was just like all these acronyms um, and all these like engineering terms. And I'm like, oh, man, it's just like, is this something that I should know already? But I feel like in general, for just anyone starting off um, in engineering, it it can be a little overwhelming, but um, if you have the right um, supportive people within your group that you could go to if you have any questions, um, I think that's a, a great way of getting through that. I think that's fantastic. Support, support, go to your group, leverage the people around you. So we're actually kind of coming to a close, but I want to ask you all this final question because I'm so inspired about your lived experience, where you're going. Like, I want to keep in touch with you all. And by the way, someone did ask for your from your connection on LinkedIn. So please feel free to put it in the chat. But the question for you all is, as you look at your career, based on all that you shared today, what are your fighting words? What are, what are one or two words or a quick phrase that you use to feel powerful, inspired, and what will continue to help you thrive in your field. So what are your power words? Leave that with our audience. Clarice, go ahead. So for fighting words, I guess it's more like a song. I always think of uh, Beyonce's Run the World <laughs> specifically. It's something that plays in my head when I'm like, you know what, no, you got this. Uh, and um, that's what I usually um, think in my head whenever I'm feeling down, need some burst of energy and need a little push. Um, I, I like to think of only you are you and we need you. Mm, powerful. Beyonce and only you are you and we need you. I think that's all we need for today. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, listen, it looks like we've come to all to the end of our time. And this is all the time that we have for questions right now. Monica and Clarice, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to not only be a part of the Persist series, but to celebrate International Women's Day and for speaking with us so candidly. Your shared and lived experiences are absolutely fantastic. So round of applause, please give them emojis. We thank you, thank you, thank you. 
I also want to thank our sponsors, Bechtel and TE Connectivity, as well as our partner, WePan, for collaborating with us. Please feel free to go and check out our Persist Series on-demand sessions at discovere.org. It should come at the bottom of your screen and enjoy the rest of your day. Happy International Women's Day. See you soon.